Coming up, we have an exclusive interview with the designer behind Lily Gladstone's dress for the Oscars. Plus, an award-winning screenwriter shares the inspiration behind his films and how he challenges stereotypical Native characters. And we look back at the lifetime achievements of a former Miss Navajo and community leader. Those interviews plus headlines are next on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Hopa. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today in the Pacific Northwest, where climate change is on the ballot in Washington state and the outcome could impact Native nations. Our Mark Trahant was in Washington to see how this law's repeal could impact tribes. Hi, Mark. Hi, Aliyah. Washington's climate law that caps emissions and raises funds for projects has been called innovative and a sneaky tax on energy consumers. This fall, voters will get their say. Ballot Measure 2117 would repeal the carbon cap and investment law. I went to Washington last week to take a look. Our ancestors have long foretold of a day of reckoning. I believe we are in that day of reckoning. Uh, they understood that the world was on a trajectory that just simply wasn't sustainable. The state of Washington and the 29 tribes here have been working for a long time to meet that day of reckoning. This story starts in 2021 here in Olympia, where legislators look for new ways to raise funds to implement climate programs in communities, including in tribal nations. After several starts and stops, the state passed the 2021 Climate Commitment Act. That law collects fees directly from companies tied to their carbon emissions, some $1.3 billion. This is a new revenue stream for investments ranging from electric heavy trucks and boats to more efficient home heating systems. The fund also pays for a transit pass for every young person in the state. Our uh, state and, and a lot of environmental leaders, conservation leaders and organizations have been working to put a price on carbon um, almost for a decade now in various forms, initiatives, uh, and I think along the way had learned a lot of lessons around what, what works, what people are ready for, what's it going to take. And so that meant uh, having an environmental justice um, at the center. It meant uh, working with tribes. That environmental justice includes a fund, some $130 million, designated directly for tribal nations. Critics say the law costs too much, especially at the gas pump. Washington has the third highest gas prices in the country. I think you need to think it will go back to the drawing board and think of policies that will benefit people without um, destroying opportunities for themselves, their children, and their children's children. And I, I think that's where we diverge. I said it makes more sense to agree on a national climate policy, not one state by state. I think it's a policy that isn't appropriate for our state. Um, and I think that without the CCN, without the tax, carbon tax on fuels, our society as a whole is moving towards decarbonization, whether some of us like it or not, right? And, and so to have the CCA was just an expensive, unnecessary layer that we don't need. And I think people can agree with that. It's worth noting that 24 states have acted to reduce carbon emissions, and 11 of those states have some form of carbon caps. Under Washington's Climate Commitment Act, the state is investing millions of dollars into tribal communities. Climate-related spending ranges from new clean energy projects to the modernization of schools and other buildings. The Nisqually tribe has converted its elder center into solar, and is now looking at the prospect of a tribal microgrid. The Nooksack tribe is studying a geothermal energy project, and the Yakima Nation is leveraging the state's funds plus a Federal Department of Energy grant that will build a $50 million plus solar and hydro project using open air irrigation canals. This is a project that adds to the energy grid 
and boosts the water supply. Indigenous leaders are linking climate initiatives with cultural values. In the Quinault Nation, that means land back. We gained a, a $25 million uh, appropriation out of the Washington State Legislature, this legislative session from the Climate Commitment Act to acquire the last remaining large uh, 10,000 acres of uh, timber land. The land is slated to be used for carbon sequestration, basically using the forest land as a sink to reduce the carbon that goes into the atmosphere. But there is an asterisk on the state's appropriation. If Measure 2117 is enacted, funding for these climate-related initiatives will be gone. On the Quinault Nation, tribal citizens take the long view, even though this is a community where the impact of climate change is now. The nation is building a new village on higher ground, away from rising seas and storm surges. So it'll offer an extra 30 residential lots, and then it will primarily be the, the relocation of all of and our government. When all leaders know the best route forward for managing climate challenges is listening to and working with tribal governments. And a repeal of the state's climate law would mean starting again. There's an entire world of opportunity where others fail to lead, fail to act, fail to, to respond to traditional and ancient values that are proven through centuries. Uh, as others are collapsing around us, we're rising. And everybody knows at some level, indigenous people hold such power, resilience, knowledge, and wisdom. Uh, but when we're able to, to do that in a way to lead the rest of the world out of this uh, crisis, that's the opportunity that we see. If we're going to truly move the paradigm forward and shift um, our ways of thinking and acting in the face of climate change, it's going to happen best when tribes have the most authority, autonomy, and self-governance over those decisions and affairs. On the Quinault Nation, Mark Trahant for ICT News. Aliyah, this story was produced as part of a partnership between ICT and the PBS NewsHour to cover how climate change is impacting indigenous communities. Mark, thank you so much for that reporting. We head now to Montana, where Killers of the Flower Moon star Lily Gladstone has been bestowed one of the highest honors possible from her Blackfeet Nation. On Tuesday, Gladstone was given a stand-up headdress created by Elder Charlene Plume. More than 1,000 people joined for the nation's official designation of Lily Gladstone Day in Browning. She's bringing our like awareness out to how our community is, how faltering, how funny it is. The celebration featured a grand entry and honor songs, including from the youth drum group, the Willow Creek Singers. Many in the community greeted Gladstone with warm words and hugs with the native children. Earlier this year, Gladstone made history as the first indigenous person to win a Golden Globe for Best Actress, as well as becoming the first Native American person to be nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress. In Alaska, tribes are taking the lead in testing their communities for toxins. The state of Alaska tests all commercially sold shellfish for toxins, but local community harvests are not tested. Because of this, coastal indigenous communities who depend on traditional wild harvested shellfish are at high risk of poisoning. The Southeast Alaska Tribal Ocean Research Network will test samples for community members who send them in in their new program. Between 19 1993 and 2021, Alaska Natives suffered 53 percent of the state's recorded PSP toxin cases. The network will publicly share the program's toxin data to inform harvesting decisions. The Juno Awards were all the rave last weekend in Canada. It's the equivalent of the Grammys here in the U.S. From our partners at APTN, here's Angel Moore with this wrap-up. The 2024 Junos honoured the achievements of Canadian music and this year did not disappoint with Indigenous artists. A. Sanabi from the Sandy Lake First Nation in Northern Ontario won Songwriter of the Year and Alternative Album of the Year. Uh, I grew up in a, in a trailer in Northern Ontario without electricity and running water and now I'm here. Traditional Indigenous Artist or Group of the Year was awarded to Joel Wood. Wood has also performed with Northern Cree. Accompanied on stage with his wife, Wood thanked the youth. And I want to give a shout out to all those little res boys, res girls back home. 
who turn over their their mom's laundry basket and they jam them powwow songs and Sundance songs and prayer songs. Inuk singer and songwriter Ailey Seppi won Indigenous Artists or Group of the Year. So this is to my uncle's um, Saglak band. They formed a rock and roll band after their residential schools and they pretty much formed me. They made me who I am. Contemporary Roots Album of the Year went to William Prince of the Peguas First Nation. Prince played music with his father at gigs in northern Manitoba. All the youth of the Peguas First Nation, uh, it takes a real village to lift somebody like myself so high. So thank you so much for this honour and stand in the joy, my friends. The 2025 Junos will be held in Vancouver. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also called Halifax. Well, award season is over. We are not done talking about Lily Gladstone. If you're wondering who was behind her beautiful custom gowns adorned with quill work at this year's Oscar Awards, look no further. ICT's Paris Wise got the exclusive interview with quill work artist Joe Big Mountain. It wasn't until about uh, a few weeks before the Oscars, um, I got a, a phone call from uh, Jason Rambert, uh, Lily stylist, and um, you know he let me know that Lily wanted to utilize my work and collaborate with Gucci, and so um, that's when he said, you know, we'd like to send you to Italy and to collaborate and to design, and um, and that's really where it started, and then it was just sort of a lot of work after that. Yeah, you only had a couple weeks, it sounds like, and that was 216 quilled petals, right? Can you tell us more about the details and inspiration behind the dress and the design process? They knew that there were certain uh, aspects of Native culture that, you know, where we involved family colors and society colors and different different colors where, where it's, it's important for us. For Lily, that was the case, you know, uh, I think blue is her family color and, and she has a lot of other colors that's, that are pretty significant to her and in, in which all those ways are, we uh, incorporated those into the full work. And what was cool about the, 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 the velvet dress was just the fact that it was velvet. I mean, that was a choice um, solely on Gucci, but I think like our team in general was pretty excited to hear that it was velvet because uh, um, the entire team is Oneida, my wife is Oneida, and the, the whole team is Oneida, and um, even for Iroquois people in general, like, we utilize velvet a lot in our raised bead work and, and, and in a lot of our projects, so, I mean, I know I was pretty excited to hear that the, the, the dress was going to be velvet. Did you ever, was this ever a goal for you? Did you ever imagine, like, you would be collaborating on this scale? No, no, never. I work and, I, and you know, I put, I put my mind on, on the work mostly, you know, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just an artist, so I don't have those type of ambitions, but when it, when it came across my way, I knew it was big and I knew it was a big moment and a, and a huge opportunity. And so, you know, all the thanks go to Lily and of course Jason and all those people. Lily was the first native to be nominated in the best actress category. How does it feel to have your work be a part of that history and on one of the biggest red carpets in the world? I don't think I knew how, how big it was until really we got home. That was the thing about getting the opportunity and, and even the collaboration. It was just a lot of work and, and executing. And so I didn't really have time to think about, about those type of things. I mean, I, I knew it was history uh, um, on her part and, you know, everything she does is big, you know, coll collaborating with Gucci and then getting that, getting those dresses involved. Um, like I said, on the red carpet and everything, I, I knew it was a big deal, but it didn't really hit me until I got home. Is there a next dream project for you considering the scale of this one and now it seems like sky's the limit? I mean, it really does seem like sky's the limit. Uh, and, and I mean, I think I'm just focused on the year and, and putting more work out and staying on top of what I feel like I do best. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the opportunities are always incredible. And uh, anytime I'm able to, to get involved in anything, um, but I, I, I like to focus on the work and, and focus on, on those kind of things and what comes comes and yeah, just focusing on the work. Well, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Movies and TV shows begin with a script, and writer Chris Many Deeds hopes to use his pen to challenge cinematic stereotypes while redefining Indigenous storytelling. ICT producer Shirley Snavy talks with the Standing Rock tribal citizen about his award-winning works. My first screenplay, which is a feature film called Bounce, it's set in the future uh, where uh, the, an astronaut comes back from space 100 years later and he discovers his family again on Standing Rock. The inspiration came to me from a couple different sources. The first one was the idea that Indians are extinct. I actually had a, a film producer actually say that to me. He said, I heard that Indians were put on reservations and then they went extinct. And I'm like, well, you're talking to me, so that must be pretty tough, I don't know. My grandfather was awarded a silver medal from Congress for being a co-talker in World War I. And at the ceremony, I was in this auditorium filled with people who I was all related to, but I actually had never met. But the story uh, involves all the, all the sort of things that I wanted to talk about, which is that uh, in most stories involving Native Americans, you have the magic Indian, the magic Indian who has superpowers somehow but can't solve his own situation. One of the things that the non-Indians were saying to me, like, well, shouldn't he have like a vision? And I'm like, why would he have a vision? What does that do? <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't pertinent to the story. The other one, another one said, well, shouldn't he be taking peyote? And like, why would he be taking peyote? It didn't make any sense. And uh, I, I wanted to, these characters to be more realistic, more based on, on what humans actually do, what Native Americans actually do every day. Many Deeds' other award-winning script is Injustice, Ex Parte, Crow Dog. These are stories that, you know, until I took these in law school, I had never heard of, of some of these things. And you just kind of accept how things are on reservations for what they are, right? Uh, this is the way it is. Well, it's not. It came to be about through a series of court decisions, mainly. And in this case, uh, it was about major Indian crimes on a reservation. Since it's an anthology, this would be one episode. And we address every one of the sort of episodes that we come across, like um, uh, Johnson versus McIntosh, which is a early Supreme Court case. And it, it determines who has title. And it brings up the very first time the doctrine of discovery. Say, and the doctrine of discovery is is a fairly racist policy that says that uh, Indians you may have lived on this land, but it, when we came in, we discovered it, and therefore we are the only ones who have proper title. One of the things I'm working on right now is a comedy about a non-Indian being a pretend Indian in academia and in the film world which um, is something, um, if you work in the federal government, you work with a lot of Native people who are enrolled members of federal tribes. It's an experience that you don't have when you step outside of that world. When I started working with uh, writers in this sort of thing, you run into people who, who have these sort of claims and only because there's a financial gain. The screenplays I've written so far and submitted to contests, I've won uh, quite a few awards for Bounce and for and for uh, Ex Parte Crow Dog, which is something else for young writers, is that you really shouldn't take no 
for an answer. And you need to really explore all your options when you're writing. Uh, screen, there are all, all sorts of screen contests for screenwriting and for, t and for TV. You need to consider them all and uh, get your name out there and get it generated. That, that's a big deal here because a lot of people that you run into will still have some of these old tropes in their mind. And if they don't fit those tropes, they're, they're not going to do anything for you. So you need to find the groups of people who will work with you and promote you. At FEMA, a huge part of our mission is to make sure we are preparing the nation for catastrophic events. As extreme weather continues to become more intense and frequent, disaster preparedness has never been more important. Older adults face even greater risks and challenges when it comes to preparing, especially those who live independently, have low income, have disabilities, or live in rural areas. This May, President Biden announced Older Americans Month, reminding us that older Americans are the pillars of our community, and we owe it to them to value their wisdom, celebrate their contributions, and champion their well-being. This September, I'm excited to announce that National Preparedness Month will have a special focus on the older adult population. Through our Ready campaign, FEMA is evolving the way we engage with communities to be more inclusive and impactful than ever before. Today, I ask you to join us in our efforts by finding ways to help prepare the older adults in your network or community. Stay tuned for new tools and resources, but don't wait. Visit ready.gov to get started. Thank you. Up judge. I'll see you again. Up means again. Up judge is I'll see you again because there is no such thing as goodbye in the Passamaquoddy language. March is Women's History Month to celebrate the women who have made a difference in our lives and in the lives of their native nations. Here's an encore presentation of an interview from our archives. ICT producer Shirley Snavy speaks with Joy Hanley as she reflects on a lifetime of achievements. The Phoenix Indian Center honored a dozen leaders last November. One of them is Joy Hanley. She received the Phyllis J. Big Pond Lifetime Achievement Award. Joy was born in 1941 in Shiprock, New Mexico. In 1959, she won the title of Miss Navajo. Not a conventional beauty pageant. One of the criteria is sheep butchering. It was the beginning of a lifelong commitment to the betterment of Native Americans. I've always been a little vocal, so I guess um, I was never afraid to to speak my mind when I didn't think things were the way they should be. I asked Joy if she had advice for young women to develop leadership skills. There are a number of things I've tried to follow that I learned early on that, that kept me that kept me going. And one was to always think issues. I think it was Michelle Obama said, when they think low, you go high. And that's been one of the things I've always tried to do. If somebody wanted to pick a, pick, a, pick a bone with me, I had to back off because if it wasn't an issue that I was worth, was worth pursuing, I didn't pursue it. And I would back off, you know, pick your battles carefully, back off, but be, and also communicate. It's important to communicate. Uh, with other colleagues, and we learned to do that at an early age in urban areas. And of course, we did that over at the tribe, tribal level too. So at a college, the colleges, we always work with other colleges. And um, so it was just working together to be unified. It always helps to go with a unified front, whatever issue you're dealing with. 
And then when you're dealing with adversity, always remember what your point is. Go straight ahead, keep your head high and walk tall. My mother always told me, she said, you just remember who you are and walk tall and march straight ahead. Joy Hanley's career is marked by her commitment to education from the local to the national level. She championed the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Indian Arts and Crafts Act. Her husband, Ben, is a retired attorney who served in the Arizona State Legislature for 26 years. We still dance periodically. I'm 82, and we're both 82, and we still go dancing periodically, maybe once every couple of weeks. We dance in the afternoon, we can't dance at night, but <laughs> there's a, there are bands that play in different these places, and we go and we dance in the afternoon. And so, so I, my advice is to keep dancing as long as I can. To... In Lincoln, Nebraska, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. That is a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.